So here is a while loop that actually computes the Fibonacci sequence. So while loop is basically written as while condition block. Okay. So basically you say while b is less than 10, print b a comma b is equal to b comma a plus b. So what are we doing here? Tuple expansion. Okay. So what does this do? a comma b is b comma a plus b. It sets a to b and then sets b to a plus b. And so it loops and then it keeps checking for b, executes the block until this condition fails. Now if I wanted to make the condition fail by force, if I say if b happens to be 2, you please exit, you can add what is called a break statement. Okay, so just do a quick example, a comma b equals 0 comma 1, b is less than 100, current p, a comma b equals b comma a plus b. If b is greater than 70, this is stupid I know, but I am just showing you how break works, break. So it stops at 55. The idea is, so we do looping with if, while, for and if has special syntax using the in notion, notation, not in. Okay. So and containers like lists, tuples and dictionaries support the notion of in. So do strings. So you could also have done this. So if I say word, so I can say hell or okay, L. What do you think will happen here? It is true. So this answers kind of your question. So the notion of in is a useful thing. So I could have said L in some dictionary, I will say false. So I do not have to know has key or anything like that. I can just use the notion of in, it is this thing in this. And then you have for loops which let you iterate over any container and techni technically you can iterate over what are called any iterable. Now the next thing is, so this lets us do basic things, but the real power of programming language is code reuse. So the first way of doing code reuse is to build functions. Now in Python, functions support what are called, um, you can call them with arguments of course, they can return any number of things. Okay. They support both default and keyword arguments which means you do not have to always specify things and you can also explicitly specify things, we will do this in detail. Now every time you create a function, we will get to that. The scope of variables in that function is local. So if I create x is equal to 10 inside a function, x only exists inside that function. So I can't say x once the function scope is, exit, is done. Mutable items, when you pa call a function, mutable items are passed by reference. They are not passed by copy. The first line after a definition can be a documentation string. So I'm going to show you an example, so just bear with me. And here's an example. So I've defined fib n. So fib is the name of the function. This def is a keyword that indicates I'm going to define a function. The brackets indicate arguments that you're going to specify. If you had no arguments, you don't specify the n. So it just becomes brackets. If you have an argument, it becomes whatever argument in a sequence. So you can say n comma a comma b comma c so on and so forth. The first line you see here, not this comment you see here, this first string you see here is the doc string of that function. This is useful because if I say fib question mark, it gives me the documentation and it only gives the documentation that the developer has written. If you have not written documentation, somebody is going to curse you saying this guy has not documented his code. Okay, so it is up to you to document. It is a good practice to always document your function. But you do not have to. If you did not, just the doc string would not show up. It is not, it is just a convention that the first string is interpreted as a documentation string. This a and b you see inside here, they are purely local. If I access a here, it is an error. So a, b 
exist only inside here. Similarly with n, n is again inside the function scope. n will not impede or interfere with any n that is outside here. Is that clear? And the insides are just like any of the other constructs that you have learned up to this point. Except everything in that function is indented one level to the right. So if you notice this function, all of this is inside the function. Once we get out of it, we are back to this level of indentation at the level of def. And that indicates that you are out of that function, you are finished defining that function. To call a function, okay, so at the instant when you type this function up in Python and you finish the function scope, a function object is created. So think of it as an object, just another object called a function object that is sitting in memory somewhere. And this name fib over here is bound to that function object. Okay. So when you call the function, you call it as fib bracket argument and it prints the sequence. Now because fib is a name bound to a function object, I can assign another variable to it. So I can say f is fib. In as much as I can say a equals b for the previous example, I can always say f is fib and then call f. So functions are first class objects, they are just like anything else. Okay? And functions also have methods, they will have attributes, they are just objects. So that is one of the nice things about Python, pretty much everything is an object. So as you see here, fib2000 does this, f is fib, f is 10, so I have this thing, I have already typed this out, so fib, oops, I typed it out, this is what I typed, so I can say fib2000, I get this, I can say f is fib, f. 100. I did f is fib and that is giving me an error saying, so this shows you the error. So supposing I say f is fib, what happens? It says fib takes exactly one argument, I gave 0. So if you call fib with nothing, it gives me an error. What if I called it with 2? It is also an error. So again you get detailed information. It says it takes 1, you gave me 2. So I could also assign fib to x. What is x? Sorry? x is none. The reason is I have not made any return statement here. In Python, if you have no return statement, by default it returns none. But if I added a return statement, it will return that particular thing, that object. It can be any object. So I can return multiple, I can return a tuple, I can return a list, I can return a dictionary, I can return a function, I can return whatever you want. So you are not restricted by just returning something and having to return a pointer and worry about allocation, nothing. You return what you want, that is return. And you can assign that to the object on the left hand side. So for example, I will just do a quick example. Def f some junk, I am not going to do anything special. I am going to return a tuple 1, 2, 3. Now if I say f, it returns a tuple. So if I say x comma y comma z equals f, x comma y comma z is 1, 2, 3. I can also say x is f, in which case x is 1, 2, 3. Okay? So it does not matter. It is smart enough to figure out things. If I do x comma y is f, there is a problem because Python does not know if x should be 1, 2 or y should be 2, 3. Okay, so it is usually it is intuitive. If you think, yeah, this looks like it is going to work, it is going to work. If you think, hey, there is ambiguity here, it is not going to work. And typically that is the way Python works. So it kind of, there is there's a quote by Bruce Eckel, it says, Python fits my brain. So basically if you think, yeah, this looks right, it is going to work. So. Okay. So now we know how to create simple functions and what did I do here? I did not show you how return works. So return just returns and you can put return anywhere you want inside a function. But once it returns, it is out of that function. Here we look at what are called default arguments. So I have a function which takes 1, 2, 
three arguments. The first is prompt. I don't have to say what prompt is. This second argument is retries, which is four, and a complaint. Inside we have a while loop. So what does while true do? While true is an infinite loop because the condition is always true. So it's going to keep doing whatever you've asked it to do inside here. First thing is give me give me a value the user has given. So OK is raw input prompt. Raw input does what? Raw input gives the user a prompt and returns the value entered keyed in by the user. You remember? OK. So the OK value is going to be a string and I'm saying if OK in these return true. If OK in the other things return false, I'm decrementing the retries. If retries is less than zero, I say that I give the user a message saying bad user. The way I do it is by using an exception. We will do this later. Ignore this statement for now and print a complaint. Okay. So if the user didn't print yes or no, it will say yes or no. Now the thing here is the retries is by default 4. So if I simply said, so if let's say ask, okay, is here, I just typed it out. So if I say ask, okay, So it asks me, give me a number. So I say, which says yes or no. Now I say again, I'm persistent in my persistent in my stupidity. So I do this. Now it says bad error. Because it retried four times. But I say no, I don't want to retry four times. I, I'm very impatient. I'm going to say retries only two times. Now I type nonsense. No nonsense. There's a bug in the code. It does it one more time than I want it. But at the end of three, it raises bad. So the point is, I just say ask OK prompt. By default, it assumes retries is four. And it assumes that the complaint is yes or no. But now I say, no, no, I can change that by saying two. And I can say, I can change the complaint. I can say. So now I enter nonsense and it says idiot instead of yes, yes or no. So the point is, so now if, I, if I'm good, oh yes. So, so now when I put y, it said true, so it did okay. So the point is default values let you specify defaults for that function. It's very handy in order to write functions that are nicely usable. Imagine if every time the user has to use, 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 okay, he has to say this thing, this argument, the next argument, so on and so forth. If you had 100 arguments, it's a pain. This makes it very easy to do these kinds of things. The other thing is keyword arguments. So let's go back to this example. Let's say I want the retries to be four, but I want to change just the complaint. I want to say idiot, but I don't want to say, if I want to do it four times. So I say, if I did this, we have a problem because the second argument is the number of retries and that's supposed to be a number. It has no way of knowing. So if I did this and type some nonsense, it will give me an error because it says, I don't know what it means to subtract one from the string. So the way to do this is to say complaint equals idiot. So if you remember the function has complaint. So this is what is called keyword argument. So if I say complaint is idiot, now it knows that only the complaint is that and that works. So is that clear? So default arguments let you specify defaults. You can specify the value of that thing explicitly by using keyword arguments. That is name of that argument equals value. And this is more elaborately explained in this particular case. So I have a silly function. This is again taken from the tutorial. Uh, voltage state is blah, blah, blah. So I have the function here. This is the same function. I say parrot 1000. 
So it says this is a pad. This parrot won't boom if you put thousand volts through it. Lovely plumage, the Norwegian blue. It's a stiff. Okay, very nice. So now I can say action equals. Now notice there is a problem, the first argument I am not specified. So if I just called it like this, it is an error. So parrot takes at least one non-keyword argument, zero given. But I want to explicitly call it like this, that works. Because again I have made it unambiguous to Python as to what I mean and I have specified all arguments. So when Python looks at this, it says I know what state is, it is a default. Action has been specified over here as whom triple exclamation, type has been specified and voltage has explicitly been specified by name, by keyword argument. Therefore it works. So as you can see again it is it's sensible. The same thing. So there are a bunch of other examples. Okay. So now we know how to create functions, return values. The code inside a function is completely local and you can support both default and keyword arguments. Now sometimes you want to create functions which take arbitrary number of arguments. Okay. So let us say you want to say um, I want to add a collection of elements. I do not know how many elements you want to add. You may want 1, 2, 3, 4. I cannot explicitly create one function with 1, 2, 3, 4. Instead I want a way by which I can create multiple. So if you use the star args in your def definition. So if you look at this definition here, func, func star args, the args will be any number of arguments the user supplies. Similarly, if you want to do this with keyword arguments, you use star star. So let us look at this example. Func is that. So if I say func 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 as a tuple and the keywords as a dictionary. Instead if I say A equals 100, B equals 200, I get that. So I have a function, I have ways by which I can create functions that take arbitrary number of keyword and positional arguments using star args and star star keyword args. Now sometimes you have a list or you have a tuple and you want to call a function with these list arguments. The way you do that is to use what is called unpacking. So you say foo star 5 comma 10. So I think I have foo as well. Okay. So foo just prints what is passed as a and b. Default is 10 comma 100. Now if I say foo star 1 comma 2 given a list or a tuple it expands that out into positional arguments and calls that function. Is that clear? You can do the same thing with keyword arguments. So notice this foo a colon 5 b colon 10 is a dictionary. It expands this out into a equals 5 b equals 10 and calls f. Is that clear? So you can create functions that do whatever you want them to do, they can return values and you can call them with, you can use default arguments, keyword arguments, you can call functions using unpacking, argument unpacking. Okay. So the next thing is, so now we have data types, we have functions, we can build this, build functionality into this and now we need to go beyond that. So now we need to create what are called modules. Modules basically package variables, functions, data types into one unit. Okay. The other thing is exceptions which we have been looking at all this while. Whenever we got an error, we got an exception. So more details on exceptions and finally we will look at classes. So modules basically define functions variables and classes. All you do is you put them all into a .py file, a text file which has a .py extension. So for example, I have in my home directory this file here talk.py.
Ah. So that's a Python file. This is a module. So I'm going to quit the Python interpreter so you know I'm not cheating. IP demo. <coughs> Clearing all this stuff. Now I can say import talk. That's just a Python file, it's a text file. And once I import it, I have a module. Okay, we we'll look at the details of that. So basically, the things you put into that Python file become a Python module. Python needs to know where your modules are. If I've put the stock.py in some other directory, Python has no way of knowing where to find it. So there are it follows a certain standard in how it look, looks at um, where to look for modules. So the first thing is it looks at the current directory. Not quite the first thing, but it looks at the current directory. And then it looks at standard directories. So on Unix machines, it's typically user lib python 2 point whatever, slash site packages somewhere. And it has a bunch of paths where it actually looks by default. It also looks at any directories you specify in an environment variable called python path. So if you look at my python path, notice I'm doing something on ipython. I'm doing bang. Bang will actually run a shell command. I'm doing echo, which is a shell command. And I'm, I'm looking at what the environment variable dollar python path in my bash shell has. That was not a login shell. So anyway, so the thing here is, I have a path here. I don't know if it's visible. Basically, mm. just a second. OK, so ignore the error message. But what I have here is, a path that is separated by colons. So I have some directory, colon, another directory, colon, another directory. So in Unix, if you use this form, each of these directories is searched for Python modules. If you want to find out what are the paths that currently Python is looking at, you use the module sys. So you say import sys, sys.path is a list containing strings of directories where Python currently looks for modules. So I'll review that. Current directory, anything in, in the standard directories, Python path. And finally, you can check where it's looking for using sys.path. When you say import, which is a keyword, import module name, it imports this module into your current namespace. You can also use from some module, import some name. So what I did now, I'll exit again. I said import talk. So that gives me, now as soon as I do import talk, I get a module called talk. It's an object. So this talk is a module and it's from this file here. IPython tells me that. Now talk internally has <coughs> various things that I've defined. I could say from talk, I only want fib, let's say. So from talk import fib, oops. If I want to call something inside talk, the usual way is you say talk dot fib, that works. So fib is a function as you see here defined in talk, I import talk and then say talk.fib, it calls that function. If instead I want to call fib directly, I simply say fib, I simply say from talk import fib and then I can call fib here, right here. So basically what import does is it imports a module, associates this name talk in your current namespace with that module object which is from that file. Is that clear? 
again names bound to objects. So, talk is a mod is a name bound to a module object. And now when you say from module import name, it binds this name to that object inside that particular module. So, when you say from talk import fib, there is a function object called fib inside talk. The local fib is a name fib that is bound to that function object which you can call and assign variables to do whatever you want. Is that clear? So, again they just it is just names and objects and you just have these notions of uh, we will come to namespaces in a bit. You can also do what is called from module import star which will import everything in that module and stick it in the current namespace. So, fib, parrot, all these functions that are defined here, all of this stuff will be stuck in the current namespace, any variables, any functions. So, this is dangerous. The reason is I may have a fib in my current namespace, I may have defined a fib and now when I do from import, from talk import star, my fib is gone. Supposing I had a is 1, so let us say def f um, ok. So, if I do fib it works, but now if I do from talk import star and do fib I get an error. So, this is a problem. So, therefore, you never import from star unless you know exactly what you are doing or you are working on the interactive interpreter and you are playing around. In main code, in your modules, you should avoid doing from something import star because it is going to overwrite everything you are doing up to that point. Okay? So, here is an example, the same thing that I have typed out there. You can also define variables. So, if I look at talk dot sum var, the value is 1, I can assign it to something else, no problem, it will work. You define functions in the end of file and that becomes a module, it is as simple as that. Now, you can import this, call it, change values and do whatever you want. So, in all of this I have been saying namespace, namespace, namespace. So, what is a namespace? A namespace is again the same thing, it is a mapping from names to objects. So, modules introduce a namespace. So, when I say import talk, there is a talk namespace. Inside talk there are things, there is a, there's, there's a mapping. So, inside talk there is a mapping from fib to fib object. In my current namespace there is a mapping from fib to talks fib object. You understand? So, basically name there are objects and namespaces are everywhere in Python. So, modules introduce a namespace, when you use classes they introduce a namespace, when you create a function it introduces a local namespace. Okay? So, namespaces are pervasive in Python. So, you will hear the the idea all the time. The idea is very simple, it is simply a binding from names to objects. So, when you are running in IPython right now, the current namespace is determined by name. The special word, key special symbol underscore underscore name underscore underscore and that is main. So, main program is main. So, this is the main thing that is running. On the other hand, talks name is talk. Okay, we saw that the module's namespace is identified by its name. So, we will look at talk. If you remember, we had functions like len, abs and things like that. Those were what I call standard functions, range. All of these come from a namespace called built-in. Okay, so, uh, So, built in has all of these things and typically when python starts built in is there for you. Okay, so, object, super, abs, you can look at abs here. Okay. So, built in has all of these. So, the general idea is this namespace help organize different names and their bindings. So, modules have their own namespace, current namespace is something. So, this lets you do very interesting things. If you notice my talk dot pi, it was a module. 
But if I quit and run python talk.py, it actually did something. So if you look at, if I do import talk, it didn't do anything. The reason this happens is, I have defined a various things here. At the bottom, I have what's called standalone code. I'm checking. I check to see is name main, which means is this executing as main or has it been imported by somebody? Had this been imported, when I do import talk, talk's name is talk. So it will not execute this if block. Is that clear? When I import talk and talk prints name, it will be talk, it will not be main. But when I run python talk, talk is the main. Is that clear? So when you do an import, the name underscore underscore name is set to the name of the module. But when you execute it, it becomes main. You say python this file name, then it runs, then it becomes main. So you can actually do a conditional thing by saying, if I'm running as an executable, you do this. If I'm not running as an executable, don't do anything because I don't want it to print every time I'm importing talk. Okay. So this is the way you, again, you build reusable pieces. So I build something that's a script that executes and does something useful. But I also want to use that functionality built into that script. So I have some functions written there, some function that uh, cleans up my directories, for example. I want to import that in something else. So I can import this and use it. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so now we, we know how to make basic data types. We know how to do control flow. We know how to do um, while loops, for loops, if conditions. And then we know how to make functions. And then we know how to put all of these into modules. So we're already quite far ahead. So as you noticed, there are lots of errors that can arise. And Python notifies people to errors using a me mechanism called exceptions. And there are several standard exceptions. Syntax error, IO error, name error, type error, value error, index error. Many of these we have seen. So there are a whole bunch of standard exceptions as we looked at. And you can, what is called raise an error. So let's say we ran into an error. We ran into this a little while ago. Over here, I said raise IO error. IO error is a standard error. And when you say raise this comma message, it will actually throw an exception. It will say here is an error and this is the message that the error raised. Okay? We will do this in a bit. Now the beauty of exceptions is you can catch an exception and do something when that error occurs. So usually if you look at C programs often you have some check and it just crashes there. It is gone. You have no way of recovering. Whereas in Python, you have an exception and you can catch the exception and say, oh, there's an exception here and go to that location and fix it. Um, so here are a bunch of examples. Here I have division by zero. So there's a zero division error, one by zero. Um, I say four plus spam into three. Spam is not defined. So you get a name error. So if you ever come, into, come across a name error, it means that name is not defined. And then you have type errors, which we saw. When we multiply 2.5 into a string, we got a type error because the type does not support certain things. The way you catch exceptions is in this manner. So let's say I have a while true, which is a for uh, infinite loop. I try x is int raw input, enter a number. If this works, it will break. If this fails, see the point is this, if I say int foo, it's an error. So if I do this, so I'll just type this out, while well, true, try x is int of raw input, break, except value error. So when I, when I have this int foo, I get a value error. That is the value given to int is wrong. 
So, I say accept value error colon do something else. Okay, so I am nasty. So, now it does this. So, I type some nonsense. So, it shouts at me until I give it a 12 or a, some integer because then that works and it breaks out of the infinite loop. So, here is an example of break, try and accept. Now, the same way you want to raise it, raise an error, you just say raise value error, your error message here and you get this output. So, if you have multiple exceptions that you are catching for, so let us say you want to catch all exceptions, you just say accept and this I highly recommend against. The reason is even if I press control C, it is not going to quit. So, I have forced to put a number, I can kill the program or something like that, but it is a little too much. But multiple exceptions, supposing I say I want to capture Okay, sorry, the first thing is I want to capture the error, uh, the I want to catch the case when I have a value error and I also want to find the message that I got. So, in this case you give it like this is the syntax. So, it prints that message. So, the way in which you capture and you catch an exception and also get the message is this. But this raises a problem. How do I now specify multiple errors? The way to do it is you put them in parenthesis. Uh, I So, this works. So, the idea is you can use try except blocks to catch for errors and handle those errors in your codes.